All right, good afternoon. So we will go ahead and start for today. So it is April the 17th and uh, just a couple more sessions to go. In fact, uh, as far as lectures are concerned, uh, only one more session, which would be next Saturday. And then after that, according to our schedule, we only have uh, exams in uh, the comprehensive exam, lab practicals, and those final uh, assignments for the class. Uh, and we basically will be done with all of the chapters at that point. All right, so uh, hopefully you all have been keeping well and uh, staying healthy and uh, using some of the knowledge that you hopefully have acquired over the course of the semester uh, to your advantage and also for the advantage of people around you. So looking at today, we do have our lecture exam number three uh, later today. So please make sure you are able to take it and turn it in. So I should be updating your grades by tomorrow, as always. And uh, also make sure you are able to turn in your urinary uh, lab work. Urinary system uh, is what we were working on. And I did send out those instructions as well. So that would be due by tonight as well. Um, I'm almost finished with your remaining study guides for your lecture exam number four, lab practical number three, and uh, your comprehensive exam. And as soon as I'm done completely, I'm gonna send those out too. Remember in the meantime to work on the case studies and feel free to share those with me if you're already done, certainly before the deadline and work on your McGraw-Hill Connect uh, lecture quizzes, uh, some of the final grades that will be uh, put into your grade book. And uh, those are all of the announcements and reminders for now that I can think of. If you have any other questions, uh, suggestions, feedback, you have my email address, please feel free to let me know and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. All right, so here we are and we are on the penultimate chapter, uh, which has to do with the reproductive system, chapter 28. So a few things that we would start off with uh, as far as the reproductive system is concerned. So first up, uh, there are a few distinctions that the reproductive system has in comparison to the other ones, all right? So let me just quickly write it down here. How is the reproductive system unique, let's call it that. So number one, uh, this is arguably the only human system that is dispensable, which means we can basically castrate a man, get rid of the testicles or uh, remove the ovaries from a female and yet they are able to live just fine. They will not be able to reproduce but they can perform all of their other life functions without much trouble, right? And that, which is what more than what we can say for all of the other body systems, they're ind indispensable. So whether it's the urinary system or the respiratory system, endocrine system, our very lives depend on it, all right? Uh, not so with the reproductive system. So it seems like it's a superfluous, superfluous luxury uh, for the species. Uh, even so, the reproductive system is one of the most important uh, benchmarks and yardsticks for looking at your overall health. For example, a male coming to you with erectile dysfunction as, as an example, right? Uh, and the typical people that would fall into that category um, are middle-aged or elderly uh, males who are likely overweight or obese, smokers, hypertensive, diabetic, not much physical exercise, you know the profile, right? Uh, not much discretion as far as their diets are concerned. And so when they come with that problem, you do not just go ahead and prescribe a dose of Viagra or something for them. Uh, that would be a great time to have a talk with these people about their lifestyle, right? To take a look at uh, what they're eating, their exercise patterns and uh, their body mass index, their waist to hip ratio, right? Which basically is a better indicator of your health than your weight. Uh, because weight can be deceiving in many different ways. For example, if you have a lot of muscle mass, uh, you may weigh more, weigh more than someone who has equal amounts of fat. Fat does not weigh as much as muscle. So fat is lighter than muscle, okay? Uh, so just looking at someone's weight could be deceiving. 
However, if you look at the waist to hip ratio, so you measure your waist at the belly button, and then you measure your hip, uh, the point where you tie your pants as an example, or your jeans, uh, and then you look at what is the ratio in between those two, that is a better indicator of the amount of fat, the belly fat that you have, okay? So that would be a good time to talk to these individuals about uh, some of uh, these lifestyle changes, right? Also, uh, smoking, right, uh, drug use, these are some other things that you have to look at. Uh, but erectile dysfunction is often the first warning sign as far as impending heart disease is concerned, okay? Uh, because erectile dysfunction happens when uh, organic erecti erectile dysfunction, that is, that happens because uh, the blood flow to those tiny arterioles in the penis is not as vigorous and healthy as it should be. And so these smaller arterioles away from the heart are often the first ones to be affected, okay? So what that tells you is the process has already started and it's just a matter of time before it progresses to other body systems, including the heart itself. Um, and at that point, erectile dysfunction would be the least of anyone's concerns. You're looking at a possible heart attack in the person, right? So. Uh, similarly, testosterone levels, okay, uh, a lot depends on that as well. Your um, triglyceride levels, as an example, your cholesterol levels, uh, the, the amount of energy that you have, right, your uh, red blood cell levels, uh, whether you're anemic or not, all of these factors also depend on your sex hormones, okay. So the normal functioning of the sexual system uh, also uh, bids well for the other system. So it's a perfect yardstick, as I mentioned, right? Um, the dipstick test, if you will, uh, for, for measuring your health. Okay, so what else is unique about the reproductive system? So the reproductive system is also the only place in the human body where you have a special type of cell division called meiosis taking place as opposed to my mitosis elsewhere, right? So what's the difference? Mitosis is a cell type, is a cell division type where one parent cell uh, simply splits into two daughter cells, and each of these have an equal number of chromosomes. So there are 46 chromosomes in all human somatic cells. And so uh, each of the daughter cells, two of them, have the same exact number, 46 chromosomes, and identical chromosomes as the parent cell. So it's cloning. Meiosis, which only happens in the form, during the formation of sperm and eggs in the gonads, the sex organs of males and females, is the only place where meiosis, a different type of cell division takes place. So as far as meiosis is concerned, here a single parent cell gives rise to four daughter cells instead of two. Each of those daughter cells have half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So the parent cell has 46 in humans. The daughter cells, each of them, the four daughter cells have 23 chromosomes, which is called the haploid number, as opposed to diploid, which is the full number, 46. Haploid is half the number, so 23. Not only that, but each of these four daughter cells are genetically completely unique. Uh, and that's a fascinating process uh, that happens during meiosis called crossing over, and we'll look at it shortly here. Uh, so no place else in the body is this kind of meiosis happening, only there, right? So that is uh, something else that makes the reproductive system unique, okay? And what else? Uh, All right, so it's dispensable. This is the only place in the body where you have meiosis. Uh, and this is the only system in the human body where it's not concerned with the homeostasis of the organism, but it's essential for the homeostasis of the species. In other words, you can survive just well without your testicles or your ovaries, but you won't be able to reproduce. So the homeostasis or the maintenance of your species the propagation of your species is, is at risk if you lose the system. So homeostasis of the species is what your reproductive system actually performs, okay? Uh, right, so these are some of the things to keep in mind. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other facts uh, that apply to the human reproductive system as we see here. So first up, the, some basic vocab, uh, gonads, gametes. Gonads are sex glands, so testes in males, ovaries in females. What's the difference between testes and testicles? If the testes are suspended outside of the body of the male, like in human males, in a uh, 
sack of thin skin called the scrotum. They're called testicles. If they're within the body of the organism, they're called testes, okay? So for example, in uh, duck-billed platypus, that's an animal that has uh, internal testes, right? So therefore, they are not called testicles. They're called testes. They're contained within the body uh, of the animal, right? As testes. Also, uh, the anteater. That's another mammal that does not have testicles, okay? Instead, well, uh, they're called testes, not testicles, because they're inside of the body. Gametes is the word for sex cells, so sperm for males and game, uh, eggs or oocytes for females, okay? And what they do is they, uh, again, uh, both ovaries and testes are dual organs, okay? So they're dual organs. Let me also add that to the list of unique features. Uh, dual organs, testes, and ovaries. Okay, which means what? They have both an endocrine and an exocrine function. What is the exocrine function of testes or testicles? They make sperm, which is an exocrine secretion. They're secreted outside of the body or ejaculated outside of the body. Uh, how about the exocrine secretion from the eggs? Uh, from, I'm sorry, from the ovaries, they make eggs or oocytes, which again are are secreted outwards. All right, so what is the endocrine function of the testicles? They secrete a hormone called testosterone, the male sex hormone. How about the ovaries? They secrete estrogen. That's their endocrine function, which is the female sex hormone, okay? So there you go. Um, now, in addition to the primary gonads, testes in males and uh, ovaries in females, we also have what are called accessory reproductive organs. Now, these, again, uh, are not the prime drivers of the reproductive system, like they don't make sperm or eggs and those kinds of things, but they have um, invaluable contribution and critical uh, part to play in the whole reproductive process, okay? So uh, the point of the reproductive system is to bring together the male and the female gametes, the sperm uh, get together with the eggs, and uh, this happens during the process of copulation or sexual intercourse or coitus, all of those different words that you can see here. And the female tract, the female womb or uterus acts uh, like a um, sanctuary for the developing embryo or the fetus for support, protection and nourishment as you can see. So the reproductive system uh, kickstarts at the time of puberty as we see here, okay? And so there are visible signs of puberty in, a, in an individual, right? what we call secondary sexual characteristics. For example, in males and females, uh, pubic hair growth, axillary hair growth, um, deepening of the voice in males, breast development in females, growth of the pelvis in females, right? Uh, greater muscle mass and uh, red blood cell mass in males. So all those kinds of things. That's what happens. Uh, now also studies, are so well, before we get to that. Uh, so what initiates puberty, your hormones, your endocrine system has an important role to play here. What is the chief organ that jumpstarts this whole puberty process? Your hypothalamus, uh, base of the brain. What does the hypothalamus secrete? A hormone called GnRH for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And remember, all releasing hormones act on the anterior pituitary. So does this one. So how does your anterior pituitary respond to the gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, surge? from your hypothalamus by secreting uh, two reproductive hormones, FSH and LH. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone, which causes stimulation of the ovarian follicles in females and sperm formation or spermatogenesis in males. And then the LH stands for luteinizing hormone, which causes ovulation in females, release of the egg from the ovary uh, mid-cycle, about day 14 of the menstrual cycle. And in males, it causes the secretion of testosterone from the testes, okay? So uh, this is what initiates the uh, pubertal process. Now, studies are, have been showing for quite some time that uh, our children are hitting puberty earlier and er earlier, all right? So if you go back 50 years, that was not the case. I would say uh, starting mid seventies onwards uh, is when we start seeing this trend. Uh, that children are hitting puberty earlier and earlier, especially for African-American females. The average age of African-American females uh, starting menstruation or menarche is uh, earlier than any other race or gender in the United States. Uh, it's about nine years of age. 
never in history, in recorded history, have females started me menstruating that early, okay? So what are some of the reasons for this shift that we have seen? Reasons for uh, early menarche, right? Uh, and why African-American uh, females again? So it's across the board, but more so here in, 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 in uh, the demographics that we have just mentioned, okay? All right, so the obvious answer, as most of you would have known by now, is uh, body mass index. We are heavier and more uh, weighty than any time in history, thanks to our diets, right? So we simply have too much body fat. The greater the amount of body fat, the higher the number and the earlier the age that you start secreting your sex hormones, okay? So the more fat that you have, the earlier, uh, because sex hormones are made up of cholesterol, they're cholesterol derived. So the greater the fat and the cholesterol content in the body, the earlier the puberty and the higher the levels of hormones. All right, so early puberty, which predisposes you to many different types of disorders. For example, uh, the two, actually the top three cancers uh, that kill and afflict more people than any other are reproductive cancers. Think about it that way, okay? So for example, in males, the top three killer cancers are what? Number one, prostate cancer. Prostate is a reproductive accessory gland. Number two is lung cancer. Number three is colorectal cancer, okay? Colorectal cancer in males, all right? In females, number one incidence of cancer is breast cancer, which is kind of like part of your reproductive system again. Number two is lung cancer. And number three is uterine cancer, cancer of the uterus, okay? There you go. So these are all reproductive system cancers. So this goes directly back again to our diet, to our body mass index, the type of food, foods that we are eating. They are laden with growth hormone, which are given to cows and goats and fish and all kinds of animals, chicken, to fatten them up, uh, to promote their growth. Uh, sex hormones are given to them as well, again, to promote growth. So they, they can produce more meat. And so more people can be fed with a, a relatively smaller number of um, animals. It's just, it makes economic sense to the people, uh, to the to people who are in this business, uh, but it doesn't do us any good when we eat that food laden with steroids, with sex hormones, with growth hormones, because that enters our system and it messes up our own internal chemistry of, uh, of this whole sex hormone secretion, as well as predisposing us to all these cancers that we have talked about, all right? All of these cancers are on the rise and these are reproductive cancers as we can see. So it's diet, it's our body mass index, it's the lack of exercise and why African-American females uh, ethnicity might have some molecular role to play uh, there, but it's also about um, some cultural characteristics, right? So the types of food that are more prevalent. Uh, it's also about your socioeconomic status. So studies have shown that people who uh, are from a relatively uh, more modest so socioeconomic status, uh, they struggle more to have access to more organic and more expensive foods while these uh, mass produced foods are cheap. You just drive by McDonald's or Burger King or something and you can gorge yourself on whatever you want. And th that is exactly the type of food that is laden with all these steroids and growth hormone that we have just talked about. Okay. So uh, cultural factors have to do with it. Our lifestyle has to do with it. Okay. Some things to pay attention to. Um, so gametes are again, sex uh, cells, sperm and males and uh, eggs and females, as we see here. Now look at this uh, comparison between male and female uh, gametes. Males produce 100 million sperm every single day of their uh, pubertal lives. In contrast, a, an average human female only releases a single egg during her monthly cycle. So what a contrast here, right? Why uh, is, is, is a question that uh, behooves much more research and thinking, right? Uh, one thing that comes to my mind, let me quickly take notes here, why great discrepancy in, in male versus female gametes, okay? 
one thing that comes to mind is uh, natural selection. That's what it is. Natural selection, it's kind of like a competition. An average human male produces about 500 million sperm in a single ejaculate, and all 500 million sperm are racing to usually fertilize the single egg, okay? Natural selection, the very best of the best, the most robust, the most healthy sperm wins this race to fertilize the egg, all right? Uh, so competition, natural selection. Um, even so, it's mind-boggling. And just to drive my point home, uh, let's take a look at some of the official world records in procreation, human procreation. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, the most prolific biological father of all times, okay, uh, Guinness Book, Reproductive Records, uh, was actually, um, some of you might be thinking uh, Genghis Khan, okay, uh, because his name comes up uh, in many circles for obvious reasons. Uh, the Mongols back in the time, um, they actually uh, conquered pretty much everyone around them and some the first thing they did apparently was to take their women and impregnate them so then they, can, they, they could add more people to their armies, right? And so no wonder then that uh, Genghis Khan's Y chromosome is found approximately in every one in eight males walking the face of the planet right now, okay? Uh, I'm not aware of any personal relationship, okay? I share this last name and possibly I am genetically related, who knows? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do not have the type of uh, blood lust or just simple lust. Uh, who knows, maybe, uh, well, that's a whole different discussion. So, uh, but officially, someone who has been biologically documented um, was a Moroccan emperor. Uh, this was a Moroccan emperor back in the 1600s. Or was it earlier than that? Um, some, so, well, some, sometime during uh, medieval times, actually. Uh, and so this guy uh, is the biological father to no less than 888 children, okay, officially documented. 500 and some sons and 400 and some daughters. So 888, almost 1,000 children from a single man. They even did some math there uh, and uh, they calculated that this guy had to had to have uh, impregnated or inseminated at least two and a half women on a daily basis for uh, 60 years of his life, all right? And this is an average, obviously. There's no such thing as a half a man or half a woman. So uh, when we say that, it means it, it's just an average when you take the number of children and then you divide them by the number of years, okay? So astounding number, all right? Uh, on the other hand, in comparison, the female on record that gave birth to the greatest number of children was uh, a Russian uh, woman, uh, she was one of the peasants, again, back in the early ages. And uh, so she was the biological mother to 69 children, 69 uh, during her lifetime. Number of triplets and quadruplets and twins were born to her. She apparently had this uh, propensity to give birth, to, to give multiple births, okay? Uh, so even so, those numbers, 888 children versus 69, uh, give you some idea of the discrepancy between the male reproductive potential and the female reproductive potential, not to mention menopause. Uh, females hit a certain age in between 45 to 55 years of age when they stop producing eggs, right? The ovaries become uh, non-functional at that point. Males typically have no upper limit to it. So um, again, that brings another uh, world record to mind. The oldest dad on record uh, was a whopping 98 years old, okay, at the time that he became a dad. And this guy is, uh, he's still, well, I, I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. This was, a, I think, about five or six years back. So uh, uh, he, he is a farmer from a rural India, an Indian farmer, right? So. And so he is the oldest person officially on record for, for fathering a child. Um, and interestingly, he gave, uh, he fathered another son two years prior to that at 96 years of age. The wife was uh, in her early fifties, okay? So again, mind boggling if you look at these kinds of uh, the, uh, the discrepancy that you see. 
All right. Uh, so now we're looking at uh, an area called the perineum here, okay? And so what the perineum is and why it's important is something that we see here in this picture. So the perineum is this diamond-shaped area, as you can see, extending from the base of the genitalia all the way to the anal um, opening here in both males and females, okay? And one thing that becomes abundantly clear if you look at this picture is um, much of the organs and the development is the same in both the sexes, males and females, with some differences. And this is a theme that will be recurring throughout, all right? Uh, we all start out with a kind of like a blank slate uh, configuration in terms of our uh, genital uh, organization. And you might've heard that all mammals, including humans start out life as female, uh, but depending on whether they inherited the Y chromosome or the SRY gene from the dad or not, then they turn it, they become uh, male, right? Uh, which is basically kind of true in a sense, okay? Uh, so if you do not inherit the Y chromosome from your dad or the SRG, SRY gene from your dad, then you will continue on as a female, basically. All right, so what is the perineum? Well, let's start uh, in the female. Since female seems to be the original prototype, uh, and now this, that's an area that I've been fascinated with for the longest time. In fact, I have a little hypothesis that I've come up with. If some of you are interested in finding out what I call my female first hypothesis, send me an email, let me know, and I'll be more than happy to share uh, my findings and my points with you, okay? And uh, hopefully you'll find them intriguing as well. So what we see here, all right, so there is the, the female vulva. The vulva is the area of the external female genitals, all right? There is the pubic symphysis, uh, the joint in between the two pubic bones here on the two sides. Then you see the vaginal orifice, right? Um, and so, Actually, this diamond-shaped area is divided into two triangles, one upright triangle, as you can see here, called the urogenital triangle, and then an inverted triangle, which is called the anal triangle here. So the urogenital triangle, what forms its bound, the apex of the triangle is formed by the pubic symphysis right here. All right, the female clitoris also lies just beneath. The lateral sides of the, uh, of the triangle are formed uh, by your pubic bones, right? Actually, these are your ischial bones, right? The ischium, right here. And then the base, here's the base of the triangle is formed by what are called the superficial transverse perineal muscles. And this is both in males and females. Only in males, uh, here's the pubic symphysis. You do not have uh, the vaginal opening, obviously, but you have these two muscles called the bulbo uh, spongiosus and the ischiocavernosus muscles, as we see here, both in males and females, you see those muscles, okay? So uh, what is the function of the muscles here in males, here in females? So think of it this way, the bulbospongiosis muscle, I'll just call it BS for bulbospongiosis, is your um, ejaculation, ejaculation and urination muscle. All right, so when you are straining to let go of the final few drops of urine, right? When you contract your, those muscles, which is an important part of Kegel's exercises as well. We'll talk about Kegel's exercises shortly here. And uh, in ejaculation in males, uh, it's the bulbospongiosis muscle that plays uh, the primary role. And then the ischiocavernosis muscle, I'll just call it IC for ischiocavernosis, that is the erection muscle. That's the mu muscle that gives uh, an erection in males and also in females as far as the clitoral erection is. Uh, Concern. So those muscles uh, are located here, as you can see, okay? And then these pelvic muscles, the superficial transverse muscles that give strength to the whole area. So Kegel exercises are recommended for everyone, males and females, especially females because after childbirth, especially because this area kind of becomes lax because of childbirth. And so females are more at risk for things like bladder pro prolapse or a uterine, uterine prolapse or vaginal prolapse. These organs are likely to become lax and loose and they might even like hang to the outside. Um, you can have things like a, a third degree prolapse of the uterus, where the and part of the uterus literally hangs out of the vagina, okay? It can get to those points, especially in women who have given multiple births are obese and those kinds of things. Kegel exercises strengthens this area. Um, and what is a simple version of Kegel's exercises? Uh, imagine yourself urinating and then just try uh, holding your urine stream midstream. Uh, 
and try doing that for one to two seconds and then let go again, all right? Uh, sounds kind of painful and not recommended if you are prone to urinary tract infections, okay? Uh, but what you're doing, you're exercising the muscles in that area, which has multiple benefits. It, it tones the area, it prevents things like uterine prolapse, vaginal prolapse, those kinds of things in males, um, gives you harder erections, uh, better sensation during org orgasm. So some uh, associated sexual benefits as well there, all right? Um, all right, so these are the boundaries of the urogenital triangle, as you can see. And then, of course, um, the anal uh, triangle contains the anus. Another thing that is applicable in the female perineum is uh, a difficult birth, especially if the child has a very big head and the mother has a very uh, fragile, very delicate, small pelvis. And this is more common in women with diabetes. If you have gestational diabetes, you're likely more prone to uh, giving birth to big-headed big bodied macrosomic babies. So this uh, cephalopelvic disproportion can happen there. Uh, all right, CPD for a cephalopelvic disproportion, big headed baby, small pelvis for the mother. Uh, this is one of the price that we have to, one of the prices that we have to pay for being bipedal creatures. We walk on two legs, the only creature that completely walks on two legs, right? Uh, due to human evolution. So that plays a places us at a disadvantage because we need uh, firmer, tighter, stronger buttock muscles and the pelvic muscles to hold us our upright, our upright stance, uh, but that doesn't leave much room in the pelvis. And our babies have the biggest brain to body ratio of any other creature. So small pelvis, big brains, and you have trouble there. Uh, in comes the, your OBGYN. Okay, so CPD uh, because of bipedal gait in humans, right? bipedal gait in humans. And so what happens here, if the head is too big, um, then you might have to perform different procedures, including something called episiotomy, where you basically uh, apply a suture, right? You, you, you enlarge the, uh, the birth canal, the vaginal opening, so the baby can pass out easily. That also happens in the perineal region. What general components make up the reproductive system in both females and males? Uh, sex glands, and accessory sex glands. What hormones begin to be secreted at puberty? Gonadotropin releasing hormone from hypothalamus, FSH and LH from your anterior pituitary. Their general functions, we just talked about those. What are the components of the urogenital triangles? Bulbospongiosis muscle, ischiocavernosis muscles, vagina in uh, females, tes testicles in males, scrotum. Uh, then the superficial transverse perineal muscles at the base and the ischium on the sides. All right. So here we are looking at meiosis, the wonderful process that gives us this amazing genetic diversity in, in all of our offsprings, right? So how does meiosis actually happen? Let's take a look here. So uh, some uh, general notes to take at this point. Uh, humans, each human cell contains a nucleus that has, other than the red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus, all of the cells do, um, that have a total of 46 chromosomes, and that is called the diploid number, okay? These 46 chromosomes are arranged in 23 pairs. One member of the pair comes from mom, the other pair is inherited from the dad, okay? That's how it happens. Um, now, when we form, out of these 46 chromosomes in a human cell, uh, the first 22 pairs of chromosomes are exactly alike. In one from mom, one from dad, but they are similar in size, shape, and they even have similar genes at the similar lo locus uh, on the two. They're called homologous chromosomes for that reason. So like eye color at the same place in the two genes, uh, in the two chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, height, same place, so those kinds of things. The last pair, the 23rd pair of chromosomes here, uh, and so these first 22 chromosomes are called autosomes because they're similar. The last pair is called the sex pair of chromosomes. Why? Because here you have uh, two possibilities, actually more than two, but generally two. And what are those two possibilities? You might have an X chromosome from mom and an X chromosome inherited from dad as well, XX. And that configuration makes you a genotypic female. You're a female, all right? What does that genotypic word mean? We'll get into that in genetics. If you inherit an X chromosome from your mom and a Y chromosome from your dad and you end up having an XY configuration at the 23rd pair, then you are male. So that is why it's called the sex pair. But this is by no means the only two possibilities. You have many conditions like intersex, like Kleinfelter syndrome, Turner syndrome, where uh, you might have triploidy, 
or quadruploidy or even more uh, or even missing chromosomes at the XY. So gender or sex is not as uh, set in stone as we might think, right? So there's all kinds of intermediate variations possible there. So diploid versus haploid cells. Diploid cells are, uh, is the total number, 46 chromosomes in each human somatic cell. Haploid cell is a cell having half the number, 23 chromosomes, and those would be your sperm and eggs, your gametes. So meiosis, what happens during meiosis? Okay, here, this is a comparison between mitosis and meiosis. My mitosis takes place in all of your body cells with the exception of sex cells. That's where meiosis takes place. Mitosis gives rise to two genetically identical daughter cells. Meiosis gives rise to four genetically unique daughter cells. Mitosis produces uh, diploid cells, two daughter cells with exactly the same number of chromosomes as the, as the parent cell. Meiosis produces haploid cells. All four of those daughter cells have only half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. Uh, Meiosis also includes a wonderful, wonderful process called crossing over. Uh, and this is something that I can gush over my entire life and not fully comprehend the, the, uh, the amazing nature. And we, we, we will get into what crossing over is. Mitosis doesn't show any crossing over. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what this meiosis, uh, the my meiotic stages are all about. So here we are looking at uh, a picture of the stages of meiosis. So one thing to remember uh, is that meiosis actually goes through two cycles, okay? So therefore it's labeled meiosis one, as you see here versus meiosis two. Uh, in mitosis, there's only one cycle. So there's no like mitosis one, mitosis two. In meiosis, uh, you have to label which uh, part of the cycle you're talking about one or two, okay? One thing to remember. So there's, um, and each of, those cycles has four stages. So eight stages in all, meiosis one and meiosis two. Okay, so let's take a look at what those stages are. The first stage is called prophase one, right here. Pro means something that comes before, right? Pro, so prophase one is the first phase. Uh, and this also happens to be the longest phase uh, in terms of time, okay? So what happens during prophase one? Well, the, um, the nuclear envelope, which is the the nuclear membrane here, it kind of dissolves, okay? Uh, it 